Okay. We are now live. Let's kick it off. Well, thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tim Law. I'm a partner at Greenberg Troy, and I'm uh, joined here by a panel of experts uh, to talk about a number of employee-related issues given the COVID-19. Tim, having a little difficulty hearing you. Okay. Is that any better? Right. Better. Yeah, there you go. Better. So let me do a brief introduction. Uh, first, we have Becky D'Souza, who is a partner at Connexus. Uh, Becky is a specialist in consulting, recruiting, uh, in HR-related functions. We also have my partner, Mark Kempel, uh, who uh, is an employment law specialist at Greenberg Troy. And then we have David Lewis, who is the CEO of 8020 Consulting, a strategic financial, financial consulting firm. And finally, John Viola, who's a partner at Thompson Coburn, who's also an expert in labor and employment issues. Given the time constraints, uh, it, we presume that you'll have a lot of questions, but we'd ask if you could hold the questions. If we have time at the end, um, we'll be here uh, to answer questions, even if it goes on a little later. Uh, but you also can email your questions uh, to Michael Rivera, uh, whose email address is mrivera at acg.org and Michael will uh, send your questions to all of us and uh, we'll get answers to you. So with that, let's turn to the first topic, managing personnel, okay? And, and from each of your individual perspectives, what are sort of the three top considerations or issues uh, that you think employers should uh, keep in mind and drive their behavior uh, through the COVID-19 crisis. Becky, let's start with you to get your uh, thoughts. Absolutely, and as as uh, as mentioned, as Tim mentioned, my, my focus in my search practice is primarily placing HR executives, so I spend a lot of time speaking to HR candidates as well as speaking to HR teams on the client side. And so my, my perspective will probably be skewed a little bit more in that direction. And I think from with regards to sort of top considerations during this, crisis. Um, some of these may sound a little obvious, but I, I definitely think worth, worth mentioning. And I think the order is going to be a little different for individuals as well. But I think sort of first and foremost, what I'm what I'm hearing and what I recommend to HR people as well as leaders of companies is it may sound selfish, but sort of first and foremost, focusing on yourself, making sure that you've got, you know, you're, you're healthy, your family's healthy, and that you can sort of be the, the voice of reason and remain calm during all of this. You're going to really set the tone the way you react to this is going to set the tone for the rest of the organization. Um, secondarily, but also very, very important is focusing on the health and safety of your employees, ensuring that they feel safe, that their families are safe, um, that they have the resources they need to be doing their job, whether they're remote or you know, working still as essential workers on site, and so that they can remain productive during this period. And then obviously another critical point is looking at the health and safety of your organization and really assessing, um, you know, what does this mean to you in the short term as well as the long term? And as an HR practitioner, being able to support that. There may be some tough decisions that need to be made during times like this, and um, HR should be there to support those decisions and help communicate things importantly, you know, help communicate things out to the employees. So uh, across the board, focusing on the health and wellness of yourself, your employees, and clearly your organization. And Mark, how about you? Sure, Tim. Um, so I come at this from the perspective of a, a litigator and counselor. I do employment work. I do a lot of class action defense. And therefore, I'm mindful of sort of what's coming down the road. The, the first thing I think that's most important is you got to keep the goal in mind here. Look, some businesses may do well in this environment, but for the vast majority of businesses, their goal needs to be to come out of this successfully and to get through and and when this crisis abates, be able to bring the workforce back and get it up and running. So you need to keep employees close. Um, you don't want to alienate, particularly employees that have cultivated goodwill, that are specialized in some fashion or serve some unique role in the organization. So in approaching decisions that we'll get into about termination, layoff, um, you know, leave decisions, I think that needs to be front of mind. You need to be able to reassemble your workforce at the end and, and not have them alienated. Point two is, uh, point two is, 
to kind of do the right thing in this environment, both in terms of what the, the new regs are going to require and what's best for your business. The DO, the Department of Labor, is, has been putting out a lot of regs at a fairly frantic pace, and they're not necessarily a model of clarity. And that puts you and your advisors in a difficult position. But I would suggest, you know, really look toward the intent of the statutes and these regulations rather than a misplaced word. And there are a lot of misplaced words out there that you could argue, maybe I don't have to post that notice on via email. I don't have to put it on the internet. I don't have to direct mail it. They use the word may in this context instead of shall, though the clear intent was shall in that context. So it's not only just doing right by your employees, but making sure that you avoid litigation down the road. And then the third consideration, sort of at a macro level that I would say is stay tuned. Congress and the Department of Labor do not see eye to eye on the meaning of a lot of these newly enacted statutes. Just yesterday, we got new regulations from the Department of Labor. And today there's a new letter out from the chairman of the subcommittee on um, uh, appropriations, uh, labor, health, I can't recall, just came out taking strong issue with some of the, the focal, central uh, regulatory comments that have been issued by the Department of Labor. So this is not settled. The meaning of these changes is by no means settled, so stay tuned. So those are my takeaways at a, at a macro level. Thanks, Mark. David, from your perspective, what do you think <laughs> the big considerations are? Sure. Um, well, I was asked to uh, answer that question as it relates to the CEO and the CFO. So for those uh, two offices, I would say the following. Uh, from the CEO perspective, the CEO has to lead remotely and needs to get comfortable using new technology to do it. And so uh, communicate frequently, communicate factually, and have your behavior and how you communicate guided by the core values of your organization. So for example, if one of your values is transparency, share the information with your people. They're not children, they're mature adults and they will be able to detect if they're being, um, I guess, if issues are being glossed over, they'll know it. That's one thing. Uh, this For this office of the CFO and the CEO, I think uh, what's interesting in terms of embracing this new technology is I think of the CFO as the most conservative um, executive, usually uh, among the C-suite executives. And um, because of their academic and professional upbringing. And so CFOs are going to have to get comfortable with the idea when they're raised in an environment of wanting to have proper controls, that people can actually work remotely, be productive, be happier, cost less money to the company and be healthier and not have to report in at a, spe a specific time every day. And I think that's going to be an adjustment for CFOs. And if they embrace it, I think it'll be great for them and their company's bottom line. At the CEO level, um, particularly, I'm 60 years old. I'm not asking everybody else, um, except for Becky, how old they are. I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, for people who are in their late 40s, 50s, uh, or my age, uh, and that's a lot of CEOs outside of tech, you know, we might be old school about having to go on in-person meetings all the time. I spend most of my time in my car. I'm not going to do that anymore because what I found during this period is you can have more and actually more intimate interactions with your team and with clients doing in an environment like this. So I, I actually believe it's the, a lot of the learning from this is going to actually fall into the um, brains of the CFOs and CEOs of organizations. I think that that could be exciting and transformational. And John, how about from your perspective? Well, thanks, Tim. I come at it from a perspective of litigation and counseling employers on how to avoid litigation and then defending them that when they do get sued. So I come at it from a similar perspective to Mark. But when I look at it, I think the first and foremost factor should be employee and customer safety. That has to come first. So for businesses that are considered essential, and even those that are not considered essential, and have employees working remotely or teleworking, employers need to make sure they're taking appropriate health measures to keep people safe and make the appropriate notifications to employees if someone reports testing positive for COVID-19 or has left the workplace with symptoms or has requested leave to be tested or even has quarantined themselves. And I think that employers who believe they're essential to the various stay in place and shutdown orders 
also need to make sure they actually are essential under federal, state, and local laws. And they should assemble, if they haven't done it already, information and documentation so they can prove this in case law enforcement or another government agency tries to shut them down. Now, we also know that various employers, unfortunately, have had a layoff or terminate employees due to the economic downturn and the really dramatic decrease in business that's happening. So employers need to make sure that any reductions in staff are done in a non-discriminatory way and to give reasons for their actions so they don't come see Mark and I when this is all over because they've been sued. And I know I've gone past three here, but just for one else I think I think I should say from an HR point of view is that employers really should try to stay in constant communication with their employees, either by phone or by video meetings, such as we're doing, memos, maybe emails from the CEO and team leaders, just to keep employee morale up. Because a lot of employees I've heard are feeling quite isolated during all of this. And they're very stressed by this new teleworking environment. Well, it's interesting, just listening to the four of you, that, that last point about communication David, you said transparency, how important that is from all of your perspectives. And with that in mind, a lot of employers have two sets of employees right now, right? A set of on-site employees and off-site teleworking employees. Starting with the on-site employees, Becky, any tips, observations you can give folks? Sure, yeah, and I think once again, looking from the perspective of HR, Communication is key. And sometimes you may have essential workers on site and HR might be remote, or hopefully even you maybe you have a compromise, but I think it, it's important to stay in contact with your employees. If you have a large employee population where you can't possibly reach out to everybody, leveraging those frontline managers or supervisors and ensuring that they're staying in touch with their individual employees as well, given that these people are on site, it's those constant check-ins just to ensure how are you feeling? Do you feel safe? Do you feel productive? Um, maybe their hours are being cut, just you know, being supportive and, and quite honestly, just listening. It's amazing a question as simple as how are you doing or how are you feeling can just open, you know, open that question to an employee and allow them to share, not just about work, but even about personal and other things that might be impacting them. So um, you know, it's important to ensure that you keep that goodwill, like I think Mark mentioned, and even John talked about it as well, keeping in touch with those individuals, because especially with these on-site employees, they're probably the essential employees. There are other companies hiring, and, you, you know, you don't want to see yourself losing people during a period like this, because it, it's even more complicated to hire during times like this as well. David, do you think there's any different perspective or takeaways or advice you'd give to either a CFO or CEO? Um, well, I, th I think it's really the, th the things that I was saying before. For CEOs, use the tools, uh, embrace the tools that your kids are probably already using to communicate with the adults who work for you and be direct and respectful and as uh, patient as as possible. And for the CFO, um, and by the way, I'm, I'm talking about this from the perspective of, uh, of a CEO of a company where almost our entire workforce, 95% of it is remote. So, um, you know, we don't, we're not in, in any manufacturing business or anything like that right now. So um, for the CFO, I would say that um, the CFO should be supporting the CEO by providing him with the, the or her with the information, the analytical information and updated cash flow forecast, et cetera, to inform business decision making during this, so that when the CEO, who, who should be viewed as a as a rock of stability uh, during this, not in our company by the way, but should be viewed as a rock of stability during this, uh, when they are speaking to their people, that they're speaking with the facts in mind. And um, those are the, and oh, actually I do have one other thing. And, uh, and that is uh, nobody other than probably Netflix, Grubhub, Amazon, and um, ventilator manufacturing companies are probably gonna make their numbers this quarter. So I think, um, you know, CFOs need to be careful not to 
um, extrude their um, stress and anxiety into the workforce in general, uh, because Wall Street and their investors are probably not expecting them to hit their numbers anyway, and um, their employees only have a limited amount of control over what's happening right now. So Mark, let's turn yeah. to a specific issue. Uh, John had mentioned it. So let's assume you know, you're a business that's an essential business. Uh, and so you have uh, a workforce working on site, but an employee uh, refuses to work because the employee is concerned about contracting COVID-19. Um, what are the considerations that an employer such as that should have, have in mind in dealing with that situation? Simple scenario, probably going to happen a lot and increasingly on a go forward basis. But frankly, it's a very complex question. Um, I think John alluded to the first question, is, is this employee really essential? Look, before you take action, terminate someone for not showing up to work because they're essential, you better be sure that they're an essential worker under the pertinent orders. And that is not always a clear distinction. Look, it's, it's not hard to articulate the essential industries, but there are many orders, most orders that say if you support or provide counseling like lawyers do, or supply essential industries, then you too can be essential. Well, there's a lot of vagary in there. Um, in addition, many orders are focused on the worker itself, not the industry. Is the worker an essential worker? And at the time that he's being required to come in, or she, is the worker providing essential services? There's a lot of line drawing there. So you don't want to get that wrong in the first instance. Let's assume that, the, that in your scenario, the worker isn't that essential. Then you get into questions as to why the worker is not coming into work. If the reason the worker is not coming into work is to care for a child um, or, you know, or because the school is closed and work is otherwise available to the employee, then under the new Families First Act, which um, I know we're going to get into a little bit later on, the Families First Act entitles certain employees to 12 weeks paid leave and two thirds of the normal salary. That could therefore be a protected reason for that essential worker not to come in. Likewise, under the new sick leave, the emergency sick leave that's part of the Family First Act, the employee, if they're taking care of, for example, a sick loved one, may qualify for protected sick leave. But importantly, even those only apply to some essential workers. Accepted from those acceptable reasons for not coming in are health care providers and emergency responders. The, the act specifically allows employers to not allow those persons to take advantage of those. But let's assume it's just they are an essential worker. They don't otherwise qualify for the, those leaves, and they're just co not coming in because they're afraid. And it's understandable. It's going to happen to a lot of us. Can you terminate? Sure, you can terminate. Um, as mentioned, as John alluded to, be sure you've got your ducks in a row on that because that's a heck of a violation of termination and violation of public policy claim that could be brought. Um, if you terminate, the employee might seek unemployment benefit. Now, the employer would say, wait a minute, I, I have work available for the employee, and he or she refused to come in. Well, the unemployment standards are a good reason not to come into work. And query what the EDD is going to do in this situation could well find that that's a good reason not to come into work. And there's new legislation now that not only would they get their state unemployment, but they also get a $600 per week federal kicker which for many employees, when you take the state unemployment plus the $600, that's actually more than they would otherwise earn when they're working. So there's a significant incentive for these employees to take advantage of that. Another option is to put them on um, an unpaid leave, for example. If the employee is saying, I don't want to come in, you sort of negotiate an unpaid leave. There's always the worry of opening up the floodgates where other essential workers are going to request that same leave they probably wouldn't be eligible for unemployment in that situation. Can you dock their vacation pay? Maybe, it depends on what your policy states. Another option to deal with that, in, that essential worker is to incentivize him or her to come in. Offer additional vacation pay that they can take advantage of during that year, year or be paid out at the end of the year, perhaps. I think you need to be mindful also of 
Is there concerted activity? Is there a group of employees that are saying, I don't want to come in because I just don't think it's safe? Well, now you've got a National Labor Relations Act Section 7 issue, which protects concerted activity, and you can't take adverse actions. And it's complicated, but you can't take many adverse actions in that circumstance. So, I mean, your question sort of illustrates the many possibilities, issues that need to be explored. And I, I guess my basic advice is before you choose your path, think it over, game it out carefully, and, and get get consultation because this is complicated stuff. So let's turn now to the remote workforce. John, are employers required to allow employees to telework? And if they do, what sort of considerations should employers have in mind when, when permitting teleworking? Well, Tim, as Mark alluded to, and was speaking about, you've got people who may not want to come in to the office for fear that they'll be exposed or that someone may already have had it or just they're afraid in general because of the current situation. So I don't know why an employer would not permit teleworking. And the converse is also true. The U.S. Department of Labor has said that employers can now require employees to telework as a part of an infection control or prevention strategy. So this includes situations in which arrangements are based on current information from the uh, CDC or state or public health officials. And of course, you can always use teleworking as an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But you need to make sure when you're making a decision as to who and who will not be allowed to or be required to telework, that you don't do so based on protective characteristics. Because we've already seen cases where people have not been allowed to telework and they filed discrimination lawsuits. But more importantly, if you're going to allow teleworking, first of all, you need to make sure your employees have the proper equipment. And this is particularly important from a cybersecurity point of view. Make sure all your security controls are in place. Make sure everyone has got the appropriate corporate security that they would use as if they were in your company office. And under California law, you might have to rent equipment for those who don't have the proper equipment. For those employees who do have their own equipment, you're going to have to reimburse them for any additional phone, internet, or other expenses that are incurred so that the employee can work at home and do their business. In fact, under a nice circuit decision issued only a couple of weeks ago, two weeks from today, an employer may be required to pay employees a reasonable proportion of their cell phone or internet bills even if the employee already was pay, paying for those services for their own personal use. So you have to make sure you're gonna reimburse employees for the expense involved with teleworking. And last and certainly not least, you need to make sure for everyone who's telling, teleworking that they're complying with all wage and hour requirements for the non-exempt employees, including overtime, off the clock work, meal and rest break requirements. So make sure you've got a procedure in place to record employee time. And also that even though they're teleworking, they still clock in and out when they start and end the day and for meal breaks. So David, hearing that from uh, Mark and John and the, the legal aspects, anything that you would uh, advise again, a, a CFO, for example, on teleworking that they should keep in mind that uh, John and Mark haven't already pointed out. I think we got David. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I've good. been asked sometimes. Does it depend on the you know what level of management or staff the employee is? <clears throat> and the answer to that is, it's not so much a function of. Uh, some of it's related to job responsibility but some of it is related to how people process information. So when you're in a, an in-person three-dimensional interaction with somebody, some people are auditory, some people are visual, some are kinesthetic. Um, being kinesthetic is actually more risky in today's um, post Me Too uh, work environment. But um, I, 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 so we have to be able to communicate with people in the way that they process information. So that's why I like this kind of interaction because they're, you're both, 
uh, you appeal to both the visual and the auditory among among your team. So I think it's uh, it's a function of communicating to people in the way that they can best receive information. And um, the other is it actually has to do, I think, less with what their managerial years of experience or uh, level of position is, but really how many years they've been in the workforce and what technology they're comfortable using and making sure that you're communicating with people in a modality that works for them. Becky, you had earlier mentioned, and I think it's not perhaps lost on people that there's still ongoing recruiting. You got to hire people. Uh, their efforts to retain employees. Uh, there it includes things like onboarding somebody you just hired a week ago. Uh, obviously, the environment has changed, but perhaps you can give some tips uh, uh, to the participants on how, how best to recruit, how best to onboard, how best to retain. Any thoughts? Absolutely, yes. It, it's it's interesting because we were in such a candidate-driven market uh, in recent and especially regionally, um, it's definitely been very competitive and hard to, and difficult to find talent. And I think at least in the short term of this crisis, we're seeing that shift. This is going to become um, a little bit more, um, you know, company driven. They're going to be able to be more selective in, in who they hire. And I think during this period, we've seen it fairly quickly. Some companies are hiring freezes. They're stopping some are slowing down. Obviously, some are continuing to move forward. The net result is there, there seems to be a little less opportunity out there. And so I think for somebody that's trying to hire or even for a candidate that's looking, I think the one thing to keep in mind is that the timeline will change. It's going to take a little bit longer to fill a position as well as find a position. You're having to adapt to doing all virtual interviewing, video conferences. Uh, some people, some candidates, some companies need to get over that hurdle of, of are they comfortable making a decision on a hire based purely on video and how do we really assess culture fit and attitude fit for an organization and so that might take a little bit longer you may add more people to an interview process um, so if you do need to hire you need to keep going to stop completely during this timeline it could be difficult and kind of get you behind if you will in your, your talent strategy uh, with regards to those that make decisions and are comfortable uh, moving forward to onboard someone virtually, uh, I think we're seeing a lot of companies do it. Some people are wanting to interview and plan to onboard once the the crisis is averted a bit and we can go back to a, a person work environment. Other companies are moving forward. And I think if you're going to onboard somebody virtually, the important thing to remember is this is as hard on the employee as it is the company. And you really need to think about and plan. If I was going to onboard someone normally, you need to ensure that you're doing the exact same things for somebody virtually. If you hiring an attorney, and you normally have them train with four different partners within their practice, still have them spend the same amount of time with those partners virtually. If you do a lunch or a team lunch for somebody on their first day, do it virtually. Have everybody bring their own food to the video conference and and really focus on making it feel as close to being onboarded normally as, as you can. Good, great tips. Now let's turn from the positive to the not so positive. I mean, I think we all recognize that a lot of entities are uh, facing very tough times, uh, are contemplating tough times and how to uh, work through it. So Mark, let's begin with you. What are some of the legal considerations that employers should be thinking about uh, you, you know, mentioned earlier about furloughs um, and layoffs. With that in mind, I mean, are furloughs different than layoffs? Could you explain that to the audience? Sure. So, yes, a furlough um, involves no cessation of the employment relationship. It's just a cessation of work. There's an intent to bring the employee back. In my parlance, a layoff, a layoff would be a termination with all the things you typically find with terminations. You need to pay out final wages, you've got to pay vacation pay, you've got to pay, you've got to give COBRA notices and other notices that are that are generally required. Advantages for furloughing your employees. You're sending a message, I talked about this at the beginning and many did. You're gonna to need to reassemble this workforce. You're sending a message to them that they have a home, um, that, that they're still employed, there's still a relationship and you're hopeful they're not gonna look elsewhere and that when this crisis fades, they, 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 they come back to you. 
employees can remain, depending upon the plan, on the benefits plan, employees can remain um, on health care and, and take advantage of other benefits, which is obviously a terrific benefit. Anecdotally, we are finding in the past weeks that insurers have been quite accommodating in this regard and fairly flexible. Um, the government, through a series of acts, and I won't get into this too deeply, but the CARE Act, for example, they're clearly encouraging retention um, of employees. Um, indeed, in order to get loans under the uh, CARE Act, I think it's Title I SBA loans, um, for eight weeks of payroll, basically, you can't reduce or lay off your workforce. You can't reduce salaries by more than 25%. You have to reinstitute people by um, uh, June 30th, if possible. So there are lots to get those loans. You need to to uh, retain employees. The um, stabilization fund, that massive $500 billion fund, similarly requires that those taking advantage of this not decrease their workforce by more than 10%. And there are lots of bells and whistles with the regulations changing a little bit, executive caps, um, no offshore and complying with collective bargaining agreements, neutrality in in, in, in union discussions, which is an oddity, um, arguably violates the First Amendment. But there are clear incentives right now to take advantage of some of the money that's being washed into the economy that you retain your employees. A, 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 a trip hazard with a furlough is furloughs can become terminations over time. Um, California Court of Appeal has ruled that a, a furlough for four or five weeks can be just deemed a termination. And indeed, if it's a large enough termina uh, termination, a mass layoff, it can trigger the WARN Act requirements. Um, a furlough for 10 days requires outpay of vacation pay. So it, it's not, you know, it's it's not a, you can't just have things in a holding pattern without consequence under furlough, something to keep, be in, uh, keep in mind. Predictive scheduling is a problem in many jurisdictions like San Francisco. You can't just change one schedule without consequence because you have to give sufficient notice or certain penalties kick in, much like reporting time pay. Um, you know, mass layoffs uh, have WARN Act requirements. California, as you probably know, has suspended the requirement that you give 60 days prior notice um, if it's a COVID-related mass termination, but you still have to otherwise qualify you still have to give notice. And there's always a risk that, you know, if you furlough, someone's gonna say, well, really you knew that was gonna be a termination and you didn't give sufficient notice, even with the waiver of the 60 days. Federal law doesn't have a new provision for, for the COVID virus, but it already had one, which allows for a waiver of the 60 day notice period under, I'm gonna read it, unforeseen business circumstances an anticipated and dramatic major economic downturn might be considered a business circumstance that's not reasonably foreseeable. Well, if that isn't this, I don't know what is, but you still have to give the proper federal notice. So if you are contemplating a mass layoff, be sure to determine whether or not one of the WARN Act supplies, they have different, they have different thresholds. Make sure you're, you're mindful of whether one of these acts applies, and if they do, of course, get legal counsel and, and make sure you're compliant with all the bells and whistles that are necessary. That's sort of my overview. Well, thank you. And John, short of the death knell, and I don't mean to use that term, I suppose, too dark of a furlough or mass layoffs, are there other tools that an employer has uh, to reduce compensation, uh, maybe provide incentives, who knows, things that, that uh, they should be thinking about as well? And what are, what are the legal considerations associated with well, basically, Tim, unfortunately, we're talking about either furloughs and flat out salary reduction or layoffs. And you need to be wary about the pitfalls that are involved with both. I mean, we've already seen many employers just lay off employees flat out. And if you do that because you don't have enough work for them to do, you're terminating your employment, as Mark said. And you're going to have to comply with California's wage and hours laws that are applicable to any termination. They need to make sure they get all their wages, including a but unused vacation time on their last day. And you're gonna have to give them notice of their COBRA rights. So instead of doing this, because it is, as you said, a really drastic and dramatic step 
a lot of employers also are taking to furloughing employees instead of laying them off. So you can eliminate or reduce working hours by a furlough. And you don't have to play, pay non-exempt employees for time that they're not working. So you're gonna save money that way. But if you wanna reduce time work instead of eliminating all time work completely, you need to again make sure you comply with the wage and hour requirements and make sure employees are clocking in and out they're being paid overtime because they might work over eight hours in a day, even if their work is reduced, and that they're provided with their meal and rest breaks. And it's a little bit trickier when you're dealing with exempt employees on a furlough, because if an exempt employee performs any work during a work week, even if it's only to briefly read or respond to emails or to take or make short phone calls, that exempt employee is going to have to be paid their full weekly salary. And if you don't do that, you're risking that employee's exempt status. So it may just be better to furlough exempt employees for an entire work week and tell them not to do any work whatsoever. Because you do run the risk of furloughed exempt employees wanting to do some work, as we all do, checking their emails, etc. In addition, if you're going to reduce an exempt employee's salary, you need to make sure you don't go below the California minimum salary requirements, which is substantially higher than the federal, of course, for exempt employees. And of course, you don't want to forget to give notice of COBRA continuation rights if you eliminate hours or reduce hours, so much so that the employee no longer qualifies for group health insurance. Now, Mark already spoke a little bit about WARN, but if you do lay off employees, you're going to need to give the WARN notice. And although Governor Newsom in his March 18th executive order suspended application of the WARN Act requirements, he didn't really suspend the WARN Act, as many people think. I've even had consultants tell me that. They're not suspended. All that's suspended is the 60-day notice requirement to employees. You still have to give notice to employees. It just doesn't have to be on 60 days if it's due to a COVID-19 issue. And you still have to give the other notices to the various government agencies that are required. And one thing else I think I should mention is that the Federal Warrant Act doesn't apply to furloughs. And the Ninth Circuit has held that the Federal Warrant Act is not triggered, as Mark said, when employment loss is a direct function of a government ordered shutdown or direct government action. So David, in, in you, you've heard the discussion of various legal implications of their various options, reducing compensation, furloughing, laying off. What should those in the C-suite be thinking about when weighing those different considerations from your, from your perspective? Well, to, um, to paraphrase John and Mark, hire a really awesome labor attorney. <laughs> so um, anyway, so, um, there was a, um, if we're talking about uh, what are the sort of the quantitative or qualitative drivers to deciding what to do and when to do with regarding, uh, with regard to laying off, shutdown, compensation reduction. Well, I, I don't know if anybody here followed Andrew Yang's presidential campaign, but one of the, uh, one premise of it is that a very large percentage of our current workforce is, uh, essentially it's already been made redundant by technology. It just hasn't manifested in job loss yet. And so how this relates is that I think that the um, this not having as many people working as many hours or not being in the building, I think it's going to accelerate a realization of that being the case and how that impacts decisions about layoffs and furloughs is that we believe, although it sounds harsh, any well-run company should always be asking this question about their people. Knowing what I now know about this individual, would I hire them today for the same job? And if the answer is no, the next question is, how fast can I exit them from the organization? And so we all know that there are many people and many companies who should not be there, but it's not fun to lay off or terminate people. And so those decisions get deferred sometimes indefinitely. So my recommendation first would be uh, before making any uh, broad changes to the entire workforce is to pull the trigger on these long deferred actions 
which uh, in a disciplined organization should be happening all the time. That's the first thing. The second thing is that decisions about timing uh, on layoffs, furloughs, and uh, compensation reductions have to be driven by the numbers. And the most, uh, the number one rule in business is never run out of cash. And most companies that I've seen, particularly uh, mid-sized, uh, lower and middle market companies, and also a lot of professional service companies that are filled with very sophisticated people, like uh, my colleagues on the panel here, <clears throat> do not have robust and flexible and adaptable cash flow models put together for their organization so that they can iteratively um, evaluate the impact of different scenarios. Like what if we can't go back to work for six months or what if revenue does this or what if our collections erode in this uh, particular way? So really the first thing to do to have a factual basis for those decisions is to have a very robust and up-to-date cash flow model and then um, have those decisions informed by the facts. So in terms of when, um, the answer is uh, any and all changes that, uh, if deferred, will keep the company from running out of cash, which is the oxygen of your business, um, should not be deferred. Um, as to uh, compensation reduction, my uh, counsel on that should just be that the leaders need to lead. In our company right now, I've deferred my um, compensation and bonus uh, compensation. We haven't asked anybody else to do that, but I believe that the senior executives or shareholders of the company should be the first people to make financial sacrifices before they ask anybody else. And that any subsequent, any reductions that are rolled out to other portions of the workforce should certainly be no greater than those that are applied to the senior executive ranks. And those are my thoughts on that. Thank you. And, and Becky, picking up on all of this uh, and assuming a, an employer doesn't shut down um, or maybe doesn't furlough a huge chunk of folks, but takes steps, uh, tough steps to control, you know, expenditures, maintain cash flow, et cetera. What tips do you have uh, to communicate? How, how should employers communicate those those changes to the workforce? Sure. I think during this call, we've mentioned it several times, just the importance of communication and transparency. And I think that's also where, as you're communicating to your employees, whether it's being done at the executive level or whether uh, changes in hours or compensation are being communicated by human resources, what's really critical is that you ensure that whomever is communicating has the information needed, that they're equipped and armed with accurate information, whether that's you know, being advised by labor attorneys or you know, employment counsel, but that they are, uh, you know, because there's different levels of HR practitioners as well. You may have somebody that's extremely senior and has a very good grasp on employment law versus somebody that's a little bit more junior and just has, you know, great people skills. And so just ensuring that they have the information and accurate information that's being shared with the employees. I think right now during such a chaotic uh, you know, period of time, communication is key and employees just want to know, you know, be real with us, what's going on. And so being as transparent as you feel you can. And then I also think something that's really important is ensuring that you're, you know, you're not making promises that you can't keep. And that I think ties into the whole concept of the furlough you know, making sure people have as much of an understanding as possible to what does this mean? You know, we'll be catching up or touching base again in two weeks, or, you know, what are the timelines? Can you put an end date on it that you feel is accurate? And, you know, bundling all of that with as much, you know, thoughtfulness and, you know, being as supportive of employees as possible during a, a period like this, that where information that's being shared can be very difficult to, to communicate as well as very difficult to hear. Thank you. And I think I, one thing I would add is that, and we've heard it, communication is so key and important on a whole variety of fronts. Uh, one old adage from uh, union organizing campaigns is what drives people to go to unions or go to an outside party invariably is where there's a break in communication. The employees don't think that the employer is listening to them. And, and that that break in communication can manifest itself not just in union organizing, but disaffected, disenfranchised employees. 
people who aren't as working as hard, people who aren't as loyal to the organization. So I, I would personally just echo everything that we've heard the other presenters say about the importance of communication. It'll help manage risks. It'll help avoid lawsuits down the line uh, and, and other uh, challenges. Now, Mark and John, I'm going to turn to you both real quickly. Both of you have mentioned the Families First and CARES Act. Mark, can you just give a quick overview of the of the Family First uh, Act and what it means for employers? I will. I didn't want to comment on Becky's comment, though, that um, being a, an older and seasoned counselor and being personable are not necessarily mutually exclusive. <laughs> In my case, they are. But um, so I'll, I'll do this very quickly um, as best I can. So the Family First Act has two basic pieces to it. One is an extension of leave for 12 weeks paid, two thirds of your pay, um, to if, if the employer qualifies to eligible um, employees. Basically people who are taking care of a child, the Family uh, Medical Leave Act, taking care of a child due to uh, either school closure or a, a lack of uh, child care. And then here's the real kicker, and this is where the battleground now is. The question is, is that only available if there is work available otherwise for the person, or is it if, if the business is closed due to the coronavirus situation, and so there's no work to take leave from, are you eligible for this leave? The Department of Labor has issued guidance as of yesterday that clarified guidance given on Saturday that says, if your business has basically furloughed you because they're no longer in business in this crisis, you are not eligible for this leave. As I mentioned, I think earlier, as of what, two hours ago, the um, chairman of the Congressional Subcommittee on Oversight and Appropriations for Labor, Health and, and, and Human Services has taken very strong issue with that and said that is not what the act was intended for. Persons who are furloughed and the, and the employer is basically shut down are eligible for this leave. That's a gajillion dollar question, you know, because if it's one interpretation, it's a very narrow segment of society that can take advantage of this. If it's another, it's virtually anyone who's subject to a stay at home order. The other provision of the Families First Act is the emergency paid sick leave for two weeks, basically at full compensation. Um, and it's available to six different categories that I'll get to in a moment. Employers that are covered by these two provisions, and by the way, that same question applies there. If Are you eligible for the sick leave if there's no work to be done otherwise because the employer is basically shutting down? Um, the Department of Labor says no. If your employer is basically shut down, there's no work to take leave from, and therefore you're not, not eligible. It's only if there was work available to you that you couldn't take advantage of because you qualified in the sick leave that you get the benefit. That's a really big question that's being um, dealt with now. Covered employers, basically, employers of 500 or less persons, uh, employees, I should say, Employees is fairly broadly defined. It includes full-time, part-time, temporary people on leave, day laborers, jointly employed employees, um, and they use the FLSA test and the FMLA test for an integrated enterprise. So you know, whether you employ someone is a fairly loose term, and so it may be that you're above the 500 limit and therefore are not subject to these um, provisions. There's also an exception for businesses under 50 people that has to be documented. Um, there's a little bit of a little bit here, I apologize. Um, the duration of both of these acts is through the end of this year. Um, as I mentioned, the FMLA leave is available for folks taking care of a child due to a school closure or an absence of uh, health care. Um, it excludes health care providers, it excludes emergency responders. The emergency paid sick leave also excludes those two categories as well. Um, notably, the, the paid sick leave, you can be employed for one day and qualify for the paid sick leave. There's no 30-day look-back period like there is with the FMLA uh, provision. 
the qualifying conditions for the sick leave are very quickly quarantine or isolation order, distinct from a stay at home order, advised by a healthcare professional, professional to uh, self quarantine. You have COVID symptoms for your secret diagnosis. You're caring for one of the people above, or again, school closure or child care. Employers can require that employees um, certify at some level, oral notice is sufficient, whether they are taking these leaves and qualify for them. And employers need to document that because very importantly, employers will get a set off for all of these costs. They get a, a credit to social security payroll obligations that in theory are to completely offset the cost of the leave, sick or FMLA leave under these programs. Um, they can apply for that. And if the credit doesn't meet the full payout under these programs, you can then go to the federal government and seek the balance back. So the goal here, the intent, is that employers will not come directly out of pocket through these programs. But, but you know, things are evolving, things are changing, the world is changing very rapidly. Um, we'll see what comes up. That's a, that's a quick overview of the Families First Act. Quick. <laughs> right. Just to underscore that you know how complicated this is. Now, now, John, I mean, the Families First uh, Care Act, and then now the CARES Act, were supposed to solve everything. So, what about the CARES Act? What does it do? Well, the CARES Act. It's going to be hard to do this quickly, Tim, because the CARES Act is over 800 pages long, and there seems to be some confusion between the Families First Act and the. I have to read this. Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act. And the CARES Act is intended to provide emergency assistance and healthcare responses for individuals, families, and other businesses affected by the pandemic. And it supplements, and in some cases, even amends the Families First Act. So let me try to summarize what the CARES Act does provide. First, the CARES Act provides what it calls a paycheck protection program for businesses of no more than 500 employees. And under this program, a business can get a federally insured, partially forgivable loan to be used to pay for short-term operating expenses and to keep workers on the payroll. So you can use the loan for payroll support, for salaries, for sick leave, for medical leave, for insurance, mortgage, rent, and utilities. Second, the Fours Act also provides for expanded unemployment insurance. It creates a pandemic unemployment assistance program through the end of the year that's going to provide payment for those who are not traditionally eligible for unemployment benefits, such as the self-employed, independent contractors, and those with limited work history. And it extends traditional unemployment benefits to those who are unable to work as a direct result of the coronavirus public health emergency. Now, to get this extra benefit, the state in which you're working has to enter into an agreement with the Secretary of Labor to do so. And if your state does so, as Mark, I think, mentioned earlier, your unemployment benefits can be increased by up to $600 a week. So you might make more unemployed than employed during this pandemic. And although CARES also provides that the usual one week unemployment waiting period is to be waived, California's already done that. We've already waived the one-week waiting requirement. A third, CARES provides a tax credit for employers who retain employees during the pandemic. A fourth, CARES provides for a delayed payment of employer payroll taxes. A fifth, CARES provides limitations on paid leave so that an employer is not required to pay more than $200 per day and $10,000 in the aggregate for each employee for paid leave under the FMLA. It provides limitations on paid sick leave under the Families First Act of $511 per day or $5,110 in the aggregate for each employee who's subject to a quarantine or isolation order or has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. Or And finally, the CARES Act also provides limitations on paid sick leave under the Families First Act of $200 per day and $2,000 in the aggregate for each employee when that employee is taking care of a son or daughter uh, because their school is closed 
or they're experiencing similarly, uh, you know, a, a similar condition to the COVID-19 systems uh, symptoms. I mean, that's a very short overview of a very long and complicated act. So now let's look forward. And David, to pick up on the new comment, I think from the big takeaways from, from John and Mark and me to a lesser degree is certainly Consult with counsel on all of these issues. Consult with your accountant uh, on, on what have you. But let me turn it over to, to you and Becky to close out the program in the, the four minutes we have left to give the, the business perspective on with all this in, in taking into consideration, what would you say to, to employers? You know, pick the top three or two, two points that they should be thinking about in the weeks and months ahead. Becky, let's start with you. Okay, I think, you know, clearly from the perspective of what John and Mark tried to highlight, and, and you as well, Tim, there's a lot of complicated and very critical issues around employment law right now. And I think from an HR practitioner perspective, that's going to be your new reality in the near term, ensuring that the the employees are being taken care of. And if there are changes to the employment, you know, traditional employment cycles, whether it's layoffs, furlough, <laughs> cut compensation, cut hours, those are going to be the most pressing things. And you need to accept that that's the new normal. Much like I think um, David mentioned early, people aren't going to hit your numbers this year. So don't get too freaked out about it from an HR practitioner's perspective. These are the things you need to be focusing on. If there is some sense of normalcy, if there is some additional time that you find that you can refocus, try to get back to the core of understanding your talent strategy, understanding your people strategy, and continuing to rethink the way you manage those areas, but don't stop. You know, Keep a small pipeline if you can, if you have the resources, continue to interview. If you have the ability, continue to develop your internal people have, let, you know, through learning and development if you can. Um, you know, try to create the normal seat when, when able, but understand that that's going to be limited. David, how about from your perspective? There's a saying in the military that um, in the military, you pray for peace, but you hope for war because that's when people get promoted. <clears throat> and I'm not advocating war, but what, here's what I am saying, that um, what you are thinking about now, should be thinking about now is the fact that all the people in your organization are watching you and listening to you more intently than ever before. They're parsing your words. And they're, if you misrepresent something, they're going to catch you in it. And it doesn't mean that you're going to end up in litigation because of it. It just means it's going to damage the trust and credibility you have with the people you're supposed to be um, leading and setting an example for. So the, um, and, and here's an example. We have, uh, if you have a client who's saying, oh, well, yeah, we know that's the contract, but these are unusual times. So uh, my view is that contracts are made for unusual times and companies that honor their agreements with their uh, customers, with their uh, service providers and with their employees are going to be well remembered uh, when we get past this. So it's really important to take a long view. The short view is do what you have to to stay in business today, but, and again, don't run out of cash, but do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize your long-term ability to have a uh, trusting, motivated, connected workforce. And, um, and I think that's the problem. And, and that's why the uh, the CEO and the CFO and the HR function need to all temper each other. The HR people need to make sure that people are being taken care of, that the company's compliant. The um, financial executive needs to make sure that there is a, um, there's a saying that fear stands for false expectations appearing real. So panic doesn't do anybody any good in a, in a crisis. And the CFO's job is to, to uh, keep from inducing panic and one of the ways you do that is by painting a realistic, quantitatively based picture of how much runway the company has under certain circumstances. So uh, the and then the CEO's job is to make sure that he keeps the CFO from cutting costs prematurely or in a draconian manner. So I, I would say do what you have to in the short term, 
but keep the long term in mind and remember that your people, your best people, will be monitoring your behavior uh, throughout this uh, issue and you want to keep them on board. Thank you. Well, thank you and thank you all. Uh, I hope uh, that and I'll speak on behalf of, of all the panelists that we've been able to provide some insights and value uh, as we're all trying to navigate these uh, difficult times. And my, my hunch is more to follow uh, on all of these uh, issues that have been identified. Uh, Michael, I see you've joined us. Uh, we're, if people have questions, we'll entertain them. And if you know, they want to submit questions to you uh, through email, uh, we told them we work with you to get responses to them. So to you now. Great. So I just wanted to take a moment on behalf of ACG Los Angeles to thank Mark and Becky, John, David, uh, and Tim for your moderating. This is the first of a series of webinars that ACG Los Angeles is going to be rolling out over the next several months. I wanted to take a moment to highlight that a week from today, uh, again at 4 p.m., will be our second webinar, COVID-19 Credit and Cash Management. We're going to be joined by Brent Horseman, a partner at Shepard Mullen, Brian Davidoff, a partner at Greenberg Lusker, Adam Fight, market president for MUFG Union Bank here in Los Angeles, and Brandon Ferreira, market executive for Fifth Third Bank. Uh, they'll take a look at credit and cash management issues and some of the recent SBA developments and, and the related so email marketing coming soon with registration links. We'd invite all of you who are still on to join. Uh, we have additional time in the room um, and, and we've allowed the setting now for attendees uh, to ask questions. I believe as an attendee, if you look on the left, um, you can click the, the hand or palm button uh, to request to speak. Uh, so for those of our panelists who would like to remain and answer some questions, you may. For those of you who want to get on, to uh, perhaps commuting from the uh, office to the kitchen, as it were now. Uh, please feel free to, to drop off. And then again, for those of you who have specific questions we weren't able to address in the, in the webinar today, uh, please reach out to me again, the email mriveraacg.org. And I'm happy to route those to the appropriate panelists so that you're answered. I did see I did see a couple questions in the chat section. Yep. If you guys want to address those, I think they're more geared towards um, employment law. Yeah, we could address those. I think the first is, can you request employees to take the 12 weeks of EFMLA, a few weeks of sick time plus the 10 weeks of the taking care of family time up to $200 a day? Can you request employees to take that now? I would say yes, if they qualify, and, and that's the rub. Um, I, something I don't think I mentioned is, if we're talking about the Family Service, FMLA uh, leave program, mm -hmm. the first 10 days are unpaid, but, but the employee may take advantage of paid time off to fill that revenue gap, uh, vacation pay to fill that revenue gap, also, if they qualify for the sick leave program, the emergency sick leave that allows for two weeks of compensation for full pay, they can also convert those two weeks into that 10 day period. But in terms of can an employee take it now, it's, it's a function of the statute. I, qualify to take it. I hope that answers that. I think so. I think so. Uh, the, the, the second question that was posted in the chat is, given the McPherson decision yesterday in California for employers with flexible PTO policies for exempt employees, where the policy is silent on as to pandemics, can employers refuse to allow employees to take it, um, assuming no application of FFA? I can't answer that because I don't have any I haven't either. Okay. Well, I, haven't, I haven't either, but <laughs> I could venture and get an educated answer here uh, that this is tied to what I think it, uh, a lot of employers are doing, and that is having essentially unlimited PTO um, to get around issues regarding accrual of PTO and the like. Um, I think, one, if, if employers are going to change a policy such as this, you have to do it on a go forward basis. Two, you better tread very carefully um, uh, in this situation and look at the, the, the terms of your 
of your policy because while it's easy for Tim to say that it's unlimited, uh, the policy the terms may be very different. And to, to pick up on Becky's point, this is a great example. And it's I'm not saying this for um, self-promotion, but you pick up and talk to your employment counsel about what that policy says. Um, but again, I think bottom line on a go forward basis, uh, you should have the flexibility to change things. And that's the emphasis on a go forward basis. Terrific. Thank you. Well, those are the only questions that I see in the chat. So I think, uh, again, with thanks to our panelists and, and Tim, our moderator, uh, we'll close this first webinar session on behalf of ACG Los Angeles. We thank all of you who are who are still here, our 56 tried and true who are who are pushing through still. Uh, and again, to all of our panelists and moderators, thank you so much. I hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you, Michael. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you everyone.